Okay, I am Seo, hello Korea. Welcome to our presentation. And today I'm Simon, here with me it's Adrian. And today we'd like to show you a little bit of tool that is part of our work at Red Hat. Might be interesting for you. As I mentioned, we work at Red Hat, we work in the C operations team, so it means daily we are making sure that our developer friends have all the infrastructure and whenever they propose a change, they are able to test it reliably and uh, those tests have some meaningful results, not like infrastructure is broken or something. So this is our work, this is our duty. And the tool we will present to you makes it easier for us. But before we start, Let's do like a motivation for this talk. So, so the background story. Let's assume you are starting to think a new company, or maybe a startup, a software startup, or with an existing company, you just want to try something new. Before you start working on some software, you need basically a few things. First thing would be a, some source code repository where you, especially if you are working in a team, will keep the code and share it with people so multiple people can work on it. You can choose any of the existing solutions, there are some on-premise ones, but maybe you don't want to use some vendor's one, but you want to keep the code inside your company because of some regulations or because if you don't want to share it yet until it's finished. So you need to find something, you need to install it, and then you need to manage and maintain it. Once you have that, after the code grows, it would be good if people propose some changes, to test those, change, those changes. So then what you need, you might need some automation tooling uh, to create so, so-called CI-CD. So again, there are multiple uh, choices. You can pick something, you need to install it, you need to configure, and then maintain it. And then once you have all those services running, you might want to monitor those. So you, need, you might need some metrics or some logs management software to analyze if it's working properly. Uh, and also, when your code is uh, grown enough, you may have some prepload environment where you are testing if the code is running, running properly. So those things are coming in handy. That's again something you might need to find, install, and then manage. So after some time, you may notice that you are spending a lot of time, instead of writing the code itself, on managing those supporting services. So life can become quite a burden. But Thankfully, we have a solution for that. We wanted to introduce you the Software Factory project, which is a recipe for all those difficulties. Because it's like a bundle of all integrated services, all open source services, that you can use, I mean, you can use the Software Factory to deploy those services and manage them in a nice and easy way to have like working environment with all things you might need in the software production chain. It consists of multiple components. All the components are open source and also the software factory itself is open source. We will go through those services. The main ones uh, are like Garrett and uh, Zool, but uh, they are main like in the sense the creators of software factory designed and created the software factory mostly focus for those services, but there are also like all other services that will provide those helper elements that you might need during your work. We'll go through all those names if you're unfamiliar with some, just to give you some context and if you want, you will know what to read about. So let's start. For storing the code, the software factory deploys Garrett, and the Garrett, uh, if you work with uh, OpenStack upstream, you know it, that's the code review system. Uh, it's a platform originally that was developed at Google and it was developed with one main area, main focus on reviewing the code changes and discussion on, the, on those changes, not about additional features. So there's no like wiki pages or detailed user browsing on pages, something like that, some things that you may find, for example, in GitLab. But it's focused on reviewing the changes itself. So it does that one thing and it does it very well. It's heavily integrated with Git and it supports uh, fine-grained access control. So for example, like voting on changes, you can put multiple 
labels, so-called labels, and multiple levels of those labels. As an automation tooling uh, for software factory, the choice is uh, Zool, and it's actually Zool with a part of Zool, or quasi part of Zool. It's like Zool itself can work without it, but it's easier if Zool works with Notepool because itself, the automation system, the project gating system, is so called on the website, is Zool. Uh, but if you want, it's better if you don't rely on static nodes, for example, but for every CI job you have like clean virtual machine, and Notepool is a tool that can allow, can get you a fresh virtual machine from, for example, a cloud provider and make it as your uh, CI environment. So that's why we have it, those two listed as a separate. It's a complete solution for both continuous integration and continuous delivery. You can do a lot of it with it. It's a pretty powerful solution. And it heavily relies on Ansible. Actually, every job you define in Zool executes on Ansible playbooks or Ansible roles or both. And one of the neat features of Zool, if you don't know, is the built-in support for so-called cross-dependencies, cross-project dependencies. So if you have like big project that consists of multiple sub-projects or repositories, and you want to make sure during the test that changing one project is not breaking the other, uh, the Zool provides a mechanism that by the putting the depends on phrase in the commit message, it will put into your testing environment and the source code of a specific commits and releases so you don't need to reinvent that part. You can just focus on writing a job that tests those parts. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks, Simon, for the introduction of Sour Factory. So uh, my teammate basically introduced uh, the main components that is basically the main part to deploy Sour Factory. It means like uh, the three services that he mentioned is basically the minimal architecture. So I will talk about the extra services. Uh, they are not included in the minimal uh, deployment, but you can include them um, as far as you need some of these services. So the first set of components that I will mention now is about system and service metrics. I will talk about these services like just an introduction. I will not go technically uh, with them, just to have some uh, information about what they do in the software factory. So, one of the things that one of the services that we added as a data collection was Telegraph. And basically Telegraph is a service that was created as an open source project by Infus Data for gathering information or metrics. Um, Tele Telegram but basically Telegraph sorry, okay, basically works uh, by two sides. The first side is having a script that is doing something to get information. For example, a Python script that is fetching information from an API. And the other side of Telegraph is the configuration file. So basically, this configuration file is uh, you, you can set information like how much uh, time should fetch information through the S, the, the script, uh, how many seconds every second should fetch this information, and which is the script that it should call itself. So the good side of Software Factory is that it keeps all the information itself. So if you need to deploy uh, something with these services, for example, the configuration files, it can be included automatically. Uh, we will explain a little bit more with the other components how it works. So the next one is data storage. Is um, We wanted to mention it includes the bit that is also included in the architecture. It's basically also another open source project that is included in Infos data. It works together with Telegraph commonly. And it's basically a time series database. Uh, how these services work is we have a script in Telegraph that is fetch information from the API. Thanks to Telegraph, we can process all this information and we can send it to InfluxDB. So they work together, let's say. And the third part of this set of components is monitoring and alerting. Uh, well, in this case, we have Grafana. It's pretty common and popular these days. It's basically a data visualization uh, monitoring platform. We can create dashboards, we can create users, we, depending on the role of the users, we can have some kind of access to some da uh, dashboards or not. We have different kind of visualizations, and we can even create other things. Uh, uh, we wanted to mention about how to manage Grafana via JSONnet. You have a link if you have uh, data access to the, 
the slides you can access to this link. We had a presentation in Berlin some months ago explaining based on it. And it's basically a way to manage all the configuration that has a fun. It means visualizations, uh, roles, or even other things via uh, code. So we have JSON net files. And with these JSON net files, we can automate the creation of basically dozens of uh, dashboards. So the set uh, part of components is about log, uh, jobs, log, search, and time. So in this set of components, three kinds of services are included. The first one is log stash. That is basically a server-side service that is processing information to then send it to a database, like a very basic description. So for example, we have a file bit service that is getting information from log files as a service. This is sending information to Logstash. Logstash is manipulating this data with a pipeline. And then we send it to a database, for example, OpenSearch. This is the other service that is included here. It's basically an uh, analytics engine and database. Uh, here we can store documents on indexes. And it's included also in this uh, component. Why we include this? Uh, one of the examples that we can mention is uh, Simon commented that we have Zoom. Zoom has jobs, it's a CI system. Once we, the, the jobs finishes, we need to send information about uh, the result of the logs. So we can configure it in, open, in Zoom and reporters. And these reporters send information to open search uh, in an, a specific index, and then we can process and analyze everything. Um, well, the fifth part of these uh, components is log reviews. It was for the log reviews, it wasn't there, uh, it's renamed as log reviews and now. And it's basically a service that can compare the result of a CI job with a, let's say, a base pipeline. And it's very useful to get information about errors. If we have a CI job that contains uh, a lot of tasks, it's producing a lot of log files, and this CI job is failing, thanks to log reason, we can identify easily where is the failure and in which specific file. Other part of the set of the components is about the identity and access management. Uh, in this case, it's provided by Kiklog. It's a very efficient open source project. Uh, it makes the life easier in software factory because it basically provides all the information about authentication in the different services that form part, that form part of the components. So for example, if you want to uh, access to open search, to Gary, or to Zoom itself, thanks to uh, Kiklog, we can have information about the users. So why? Uh, we choose uh, Kiklog in this case. So let's imagine that you have uh, LDAP or you have Active Directory, and you have already a configuration in your company with this. You can basically sync uh, very easy the information of the users to Kiklog. So you can manage later, uh, let's say, the role and the access of each one of the users. It also enables single sign-on uh, authentication in the different services that I mentioned. It offers two-factor authentication service. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, it basically makes uh, easier the, the, the user's management. It has a specific management console. You can uh, configure it that any one of the, uh, each one of the users specifically according to the provisions that we want to give. Other part of the component is Hound. Um, it's basically a very fast Post search engine, it's really useful. Um, let's imagine that you have a lot of repositories, and dozens of them. For example, in, in GitHub, in GitLab, in this case, on Gary, for example, in this example that we have. And for some reason, we need to search on a specific line of code, we need to search a specific, for example, uh, task in a playbook of Ansible. And we have a lot of repositories, really complicated to search by one. We can use a hunt. Uh, basically searching uh, by a word like we can see here, if you search in all the repositories fast enough, and it will specify which is the file what that contains this specific keyword, and it will show also the line. This is pretty useful when you have a lot of repositories. It's very fast, uh, it's very well synchronized, it's doing uh, every uh, certain time is uh, fetching information about the repositories. In case if there is a new repository, it will appear in the comments. And the last part of the uh, components is basic, we call it collaborative tools. Uh, these are tools that can be useful uh, in the team. For example, this one is EchoPad. It's a modern uh, real-time collaborative tool, a uh, document editor. It's, we can 
something like uh, Google Docs, because you can have several users at the same time interacting with the documents on the Etherpad. It has a lot of plugins that can be useful to customize uh, Etherpad according to the needs of the team. And also it provides a real-time chat feature in case that uh, is required. Uh, the second part of the service of the components is Logit. It's basically like a paste pin tool. It's very basic uh, tool that let's imagine we need to share a piece of code or we need to share something with the team. We can copy, paste, and generate a link. Uh, we can share it with the rest of the members. And the last part is Mumble. It's basically a voice chat component. Uh, it's integrated also in the architecture of the software factory and it's basically an open source project that provides uh, voice chat capabilities. Uh, it has an encrypted uh, communication and it works with a public private key. Okay. Yeah. So those are a lot of tools that can be helpful when you work with in a team uh, and develop some software. But if you need some uh, some more convincing arguments why you, you need to try it, why should you try it, why, why it's worth to give it a try. Uh, from my perspective, it's because it provides very, very easy, very like simple solution to quickly deploy complete infrastructure that works basically out of the box. So it makes it really useful when you need some sandbox and you want, for example, to learn a little bit about Zool without interrupting the main running server somewhere. Within, five, uh, within 15 to 30 minutes, you can have completely working solution. Although it works well with such learning sandbox um, uh, approaches, it's, it's still production ready solution because all the configuration of software factories is kept as a code, which means it's uh, really easy to track the changes, it's really easy um, to do some modifications and revert in case of any mistakes, and in case of any disaster, the recovery is also simple thanks to that because at least if, if you have your repository with the configuration kept, you can quickly bring it back, bring it back again. So that's why we think it's worth to try it. And of course, yeah, uh, you can deploy it anywhere because if you have physical system, you can just run the script and deploy it there. If you don't want to mess with your main system, you can just spawn to a machine and deploy it there. And now if you know why, let's see how. Uh, so for installation, there are two main supported uh, platforms for now. One is the CentOS 7. So, and this is the main focus during this presentation. Uh, we basically have the RPM package called SF release. That's like a meta package that sets the repositories in the system, so you just install it. And then after you update the uh, list of repositories, you can install a package called sfconfig. And note that uh, because unfortunately recently the CentOS 7 reached the end of life, you might get uh, still images with pointing to the previous repositories because they were migrated to like a archive. So you might need to do those set commands to uh, fix the repositories even if it's not working in your local deployment. So that's like a workaround because of the end of life. And if you have like a subscription for Red Hat Enterprise Linux, uh, under this link you have also the steps to configure it in that system. So once you install the sfconfig package in the system, there will appear a directory slash etc software factory, and this is where all the configuration of that tool is. There are two main files that are for the learning purposes interesting for you. The first one is arch.yaml, and this file contains a list of services we want to uh, deploy in our uh, infrastructure. It's actually a list of Ansible roles that should be executed, but those corresponds to the services we have to deploy. And then the sfconfig.yaml, which contains configuration of those services. From the first time of users and then purposes, the two important values in the second file are the admin password, because this is how you can access them as a default user and create another users. Uh, so for example, in Kikok, 
and then the FQDN because this is how uh, the HTTP frontend is configured with redirections to the uh, to the instance. So those are those two. And if you need uh, detailed uh, understanding of what you can set there and how to set, there is the official documentation that is the best source of knowledge. In the last link, you can find uh, examples of configuration. So both those links are worth the visit. And then, once you have the configuration in place, all you need to do is execute this command as a config, and it will deploy all the requested services and configure them using uh, Podman containers. And it will, if you are interested, it will actually use Ansible roles that are defined in uh, slash user share as a config directory. But that's the detail. The important part is you need to execute that, that command every time that you modify the software factory configuration. So if you want to enable another service and change the admin password, you modify it in this etc directory, and then you launch the sf uh, sfconfig command again. It takes, depending on how much, uh, how many services you want and what is your internet speed, because it fetches the uh, images of the services. So usually it takes between 15 and 30 minutes. After that, uh, it's all ready to be used. And now, Ali, I will show you a little this presentation. I mean, the slot we have is too short to have the full deployment demo because it will take the, the whole presentation. But I mean, it's not so exciting to see the progress bar. So we just have the working installation. And Ali, I will just show you a little. We put the repository where you have uh, the files needed to deploy it with two, three commands. So if you would like to try, you are more than welcome. So, uh, like my teammate mentioned the, well, the repository where we can find it, it's basically a background file. It's just an example to deploy software factory in a minimal box with CentOS 7 and it's with the commands. This is just an example, a virtual machine using a DB provider. So, if you go to the CentOS 7 deployment folder and you just have installed the background and you have the DB provider, you can execute the background path command. And, well, the creation of the machine will start the installation of the software factory also and uh, once everything is set up it will start running the Ansible playbooks uh, with the tasks and roles of each one of the components but we will be able to see in the global status of the uh, virtual machine code. Uh, one of the things that we need to do is add the IP address to the ETC box in case we want to access to the web uh, interface of the software factory. This is like this because the virtual hosts that are configured are really very um, well, we mentioned the uh, FQDN uh, previously. Uh, well, this is yes. Just a quick note. Just a quick note. That's like a workaround. The proper solution is, of course, to put like the FQDN inside the DNS records if you have us for like development environment on your laptop. This is the good workaround. Yeah. So, well, once you are set to the web browser, you will see the minimal architecture uh, deployed that is basically buried, so and keep on. Um, one of the things that it does during the installation of the software factory is putting the images in each one of the components. And it maps the configuration file of the components to the Podman containers. And, well, basically, each component is a Podman container that is created in the process of the Ansible framework. Uh, you can see here that this is minimal architecture. This is all the services that it includes. And well, Simon just commented that we don't have a lot of time to deploy everything, so I will show something uh, quickly with the, with the background deployments. So, yes, thank you. So this is I mean, so this is basically the background app command is setting up uh, all the information of the background file. You can see that it's creating the bots. It's executing several commands, installing software factory dependencies. And if we go down later, we will see that it starts uh, executing a uh, playbook. So software factory is installed via playbooks. First, we have a, I will show you the background file. You will see that uh, 
First of all, we are doing the set commands because we are using seven, uh, set of seven in this example. We are just replacing the bigger uh, old repositories that are not working because the end of life. And then we start with the installation of software factory. We have it in the, in the line 29, how we get the RPM package. And then in the end, well, we configure the software factory. This is the command that basically starts uh, the installation. So if you go inside of the people machine, let's just see the global status. You can see that it's running the, the box right now. And if you go inside of the people machine, so let's see an example of the minimal architecture. So all the information of the configuration files is are defined in ETC software factory. And the architecture is in the following file. So how does it work? Each component is basically an uh, Ansible role. If we want to have a new component, we just need to go to this list of in the inventory. We need to oh, have the indentation here, right? So we need to have, for example, if Ethropod that is one of the components. And one of the things that we mentioned is to be able to deploy this again to configure the new service, we need to re-execute the asset from the uh, config command. We do it, it gets all the information of the roles that we have defined in the list, and it will start the deployment. So we cannot show everything right now because it will take around 15 minutes, but this is basically the process. Once this finishes, it configures all the components, and if you go to the website, let me show you here. If you basically update the list of the components. Right now, this is the minimal architecture. Etherpad still doesn't appear because it needs to take some time. Uh, other thing that we wanted to show is the Polman containers. Let's go inside another tab. So we can see here all the information of the uh, each one of the components. These are the command containers that are running. Each command container is a component. Every time that we redeploy, it loads again the configuration and the start the containers. Uh, why it takes some time? Because it needs to pull the information, the image of uh, Podman. That's why every time we do a deployment, if we have a new component, it takes some time. And it, in this case, we added the Etherpad image. Um, this is the process. because it needs to pull the information. Uh, after the, the slides, maybe it depends on the information. Okay, and the deployment of the Etherpad, I'm pulling the image. It takes some time, but uh, the HTTP front-end front yeah. might be already updated in two minutes, so we'll see. Okay, so I said in the meantime, I will, get, I will have the final word for you. If you will be digging into the topic and you will be looking for a software factory project, you might encounter sooner or later something called a software factory operator or SF operator in short. This is like being a natural evolution of um, the software factory project because as we saw, everything already was running inside the container, so now why not to take a step further and deploy it in the container infrastructure over the internet, so in cluster of OpenShift or Kubernetes, for example. This is not production ready yet, uh, as on the main website you see uh, there are still some pieces missing, but uh, there is a thing happening, working is in progress, so sooner or later this year you might find it, if you have working OpenShift uh, cluster, you might be able to use it, even as a production solution. And that's it, that's uh, our short introduction of software, uh, software factor for you. As a takeaway, I would like to take the knowledge that there is such project. You can use it to quickly uh, deploy out of the box working infrastructure for CICD, either for production usage or just for playing and learning about Zool, Gerrit, or other services. Uh, you have the slides under the link, you can scan your code. And uh, the supplementary material depository with background file, if you just want to run this within like three commands and play with it. That's our gift for you, let's say. And that's it for the presentation itself. We are out of time, so let me just thank you for attending. If there are any questions, maybe we have one or two minutes.
doesn't seem right. So let's see if it's, is it the internet? Yes, it's still pulling. OK, the internet is not enough. So we couldn't show that the other fund would appear on the, so the factory, but believe me, it works. I mean, we've, we've been trying for the last two weeks to make sure it's repetitive. So. OK, thank you again.